a Nevada man has become the very first confirmed case of COVID reinfection in the U.S. What does that mean in terms of transmission, reopening, and the vaccine? Joining us to explore this and other developments is UCSF infectious diseases specialist, Dr. Chin Hong. Dr. Chin Hong, thanks for joining us. My pleasure, Kristen. Thanks for having me on. So this is a worrisome development, the idea that you can get COVID, recover, and then be reinfected. What do we know about this Nevada man's case? Well, he was an essential worker in Nevada. He's 25 years old, had no other medical history, got infected like many people did in March. And then one to two months later, went to visit some relatives, some other people were sick. He got reinfected again. The reason why they know it was a separate infection is that they did genetic analyses on both of them and they were both uh, different. And he was sicker the second time around. Sicker the second time around. All right, do we know if the second time around it was the same strain or a different strain? Uh, we think that it was very slightly different, but not different enough so that uh, his existing immunity wouldn't have been effective if it were in place. The, the most likely explanation is that his immunity waned. And that's coming back to what scientists think is that it's really unpredictable if you get COVID the first time, how long that immunity would last. All right, it certainly questions the whole immunity thing, which brings me to the question this week. We've been hearing President Trump saying, hey, I think I'm immune now, I am immune now. Uh, what would doctors say to that, given what we're seeing with this Nevada case? I think based on the case in Nevada with this young guy, I would be very afraid to go against the world and think that I'm immune once I have COVID. Again, uh, you can get it again. It may be variable in, in different people, how long immunity lasts, but we can't tell. We don't have the test to tell, you know, and, and have people check over and over again to see if they have immunity. The second thing is you can get sicker the second time around. All right, so what does this mean in terms of a vaccine? And what does it mean in terms of how we as individually, uh, as individuals, I should say, should act? So it, it doesn't mean the vaccines won't work. I think most people think, the vaccine-induced immunity is going to be more durable than infection, natural infection. And we have other uh, cases in infectious disease where that's true. For example, human papillomavirus, you know, you can get it over and over again. But the vaccine gives more than 95% efficacy. Similarly, with COVID-19, we think that the vaccine is going to be better than natural exposure. All right, uh, I want to talk more about vaccines. We have a major story here, a setback in the race for vaccine. We hear several trials have been paused. Johnson & Johnson yesterday and Eli Lilly today. What were the problems? So the Johnson & Johnson uh, vaccine trial was paused. We don't know, have many details, but it wasn't like a halt. So the pause is kind of like, um, you know, it's like you press pause on the on the VCR. I guess I'm dating myself here on the on the on your TV and instead of like you, you press stop. So it means that there was some illness that needs to be investigated. Um, we don't know the details, but hopefully it'll be in a placebo group because with 60,000 people, somebody's bound to get sick at some point and you just wanna be cautious and make sure it's not linked to the vaccine. Got it. Well, do these developments suggest overall there could be a further delay to a vaccine being approved? Yeah, so regardless of whether or not it's due to the vaccine or not. The, the point is when you study large numbers of people, people are gonna, vaccine trials are gonna stop and investigate, stop and investigate. So there's no way that we would be able to have a vaccine by the end of the year, like many people thought, but rather probably in springtime. I still re remain very, very optimistic. We have a lot of great candidates on the block. All right, well, fingers crossed. I want to cover some local issues here. Uh, Santa Clara County and Alameda County moving into the orange tier today. Santa Clara will reopen limited capacity indoor dining and other indoor things like bigger, you know, mall gatherings are possible now and movie theaters if they want. Any tips for people? Yeah, so I would say that this is a crude measure, like, you know, whether or not something is allowed or not. But it's very different if you go to sort of a hole in the wall indoor dining versus like a big sort of um, warehouse industrial building dining because of ventilation. So not all dining is created equal and I'm all for atmospheric dining, but in this case, 
I still would feel kind of nervous about it. And if somebody really wanted me to go to put my nickel down, it would be in a sort of like big building with great ventilation. Okay, I think that is key. We want the great ventilation. Uh, San Francisco is choosing to ban concessions at movie theaters. You probably heard this, and movie theaters are saying, look, this means we can't make enough money to operate, and it's really not fair because, you know, how is this different from indoor dining uh, that you're sitting there munching on popcorn? But is it is it sufficiently different? I mean, it might be a little bit different. It's the same as in airlines because the rows are not equally spaced apart. It depends on what the configuration is in, in the theater. Most theaters, however, are very well ventilated. You know, it's very modern in general. And you remember, like, you know, the air conditioning is great. The air exchanges is, are generally great. But again, if you're going to be, if somebody's, like, super close behind you and in front of you, it's a little bit different from dining. But regardless, I feel... I'm still going to be like an outdoor dining person. It kind of is kind of European after all. It is actually kind of nice once you get used to that street side dining, yeah. I have to say. Um, hey, yesterday on this show, we had Stanford's Dr. Jay Bhattacharya talking about his global anti-lockdown movement called the Great Barrington Declaration. Uh, I don't need to tell you, but for our viewers, basically they favor reopening schools and businesses for people who are at lower risk while increasing protection for those who are more vulnerable, like the elderly or people with previous conditions. So a more surgical approach, if you will. What do you think about that? I think there are four words that, you know, uh, have been this describing this uh, ideology. Uh, it's bad science and shady ideology. I think it really isn't based on science. I mean, that idea of herd immunity has been talked about for a long, long time, meaning you get let a bunch of people get natural infection. But again, that really hasn't worked without the loss of life. So it depends on how much society is willing to lose life. And also, it doesn't really take into the consideration the fact that people might have long-term consequences of COVID like the long haulers, even if you get a mild infection. So I'm very nervous about this idea of reopening willy-nilly and just, and also they don't define who vulnerable is. So I, again, I'm a little bit nervous about that. Nobody's advocating for full lockdown anymore. So they were anti full lockdown, but nobody is anyway. So again, I think the rational approach in California, like we've been doing, is not based on this ideology, and we've been pretty successful. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Shin Hong, we really only have less than a minute, but I want to address this point, which one viewer on Facebook is bringing up. Uh, he says, Brian says, this Nevada reinfection case is getting reported as if it's new. It's several months old now, uh, and asking yeah. the media to be honest about it. Uh, but if you could kind of explain why, if the infection took place several months ago, it could take several months before it becomes a confirmed case that is ready for reporting yeah. that's being distributed out to the media and the public now. Yeah, that's a great point from Brian. I think the difference within why it's reaching attention now is because it's been peer-reviewed. And people don't want to say it's reinfection without having and looking at all the scientific evidence. This is a difference between sort of hearsay and confirmed science. So I think it's really an instructive case really for all of us. All right, Dr. Peter Chin Hong, always great to talk with you. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Kristen. All right, take care.